baptizing her. Uh, his name is Richard Hicks. He's actually McKenzie's uh, softball coach. And, uh, and so through that relationship, through softball, uh, she got to hear about the church and came to know Christ and asked if he would baptize her. So I'm just saying it's cool to see all that God is doing. Um, and you know, and what uh, God does, whether it's with our, our youth or our college students or our adults, is that God is constantly uh, pursuing us, uh, pursuing a relationship with you and I and with our kids and, and with friends. Um, you know, it's just a great video just to start off this new series today. Because what I want to talk about over the next couple of weeks is just God's pursuit of you. And really, there's a couple of things I, I want you to understand about this. And it's going to be in today's message and the next week and you know, the next couple of weeks as we look through this. I, I want you to understand what God's pursuit looks like. Um, and, and it's really more like what it feels like. Because we don't see it. It really, it's all just feelings. It's what God is doing inside of our heart and what he's doing inside of our spirit. And, and so I want you to be able to recognize God's pursuit and then, and then to respond the way that, that you should. Uh, because I, I know that sometimes we miss what God is doing. It's like you recognize something's going on, but you really can't quite put your finger on it. Uh, but if you recognize what God is doing in your heart and what he's doing in your life, then it's so much easier for you to be able to respond to that um, in the way that he wants you to so that he can move you from where you are to where to where he wants you to be. Uh, so we're going to be primarily in Genesis chapter 3. It's going to take us a couple of minutes to get there, but you can go ahead and turn. Um, but, you know, every relationship that we've got, it doesn't matter if it's marriage, it doesn't matter if it's children or if it's just a friend, there's always a dynamic to the relationship. And, and sometimes those dynamics are really healthy, um, and when they're healthy, then we can grow as people, we can grow as friends and, you know, relationships that we have with people. But then other times, the, the dynamics that we've got between folks, they're not, they're not real healthy. They're kind of unhealthy, and it kind of regresses. Uh, the, the relationship does, and it doesn't allow for people to just really personally grow. And so just like there are dynamics between you and I, uh, there's also dynamics between, between God and his creation. Now, there's a whole lot of them, I and I'm only going to mention one this morning, but there's a whole lot of these things. But one of the dynamics is this, is, is that we cannot and really we will not enter into a relationship with God on our own. We, we just can't do it. Uh, we, we are broken because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God, because of some things that happened back in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve and really subsequent decisions that we have all made. The relationship is broken and we cannot come to God on, on our own. It's just it's impossible to do it because of what's happened inside of, of our hearts. Here's what Romans uh, chapter 3 says in verses 9 through 12. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he's, he's making some arguments here, but I'll, I'll explain that. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? He says, no, not at all. Uh, for we have already charged that all, both Jew and Greek, are under sin. As it is written, there is none is righteous, no, not one, no one who understands, nobody who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, and no one does good, not even one. And so the Jew and the Gentile issue in the first century was a big thing. I mean, if you read the New Testament, you read all about this. It's really not much of an issue for us today, but you can understand, you can understand why the Jews were, were struggling with this new dynamic between the relationship between Jew and Gentile. Because if you read the Old Testament, you can kind of get a little bit confused. But what happens is God is telling the Jews, listen, don't have anything to do with these other people. Like, don't. I don't want you to eat their food. If they have some God over here, I don't want you to worship their God. You worship Yahweh. You don't worship their God. You don't take their daughters for your sons in marriage. You don't take your daughters and give them to their sons in marriage. You don't live with them. You don't go hang out with them. You, you have nothing to do with those people. So you be separate. You pull yourself apart from these people because God was trying to create a nation after his own heart, you know, God's own people. And so that's all they had ever heard all their life from infancy. And so all of a sudden the gospel comes. God begins this pursuit of not just the Jews, but of all people through the death and the resurrection and the ascension of his son Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden you've got Peter going into Cornelius' house who's a Roman soldier and a Gentile, and all the Jews are like, hold on, man. We don't do that. Like, we, we're separate from them. We are apart from them. We don't, we don't marry them. They don't marry our girls. We, we don't interact with the Gentile, non-Jewish population. And so they didn't understand this. 
And Paul was saying, hold on, now that God has stepped into human history through his son Christ, th there's this whole new thing going on. And we've already recognized that both Jew and Gentile, there are, they're literally pinned under the weight of sin. So we know, we know, and, and this is Paul talking, we know that the Jews, there's nobody that's good. There's nobody that understands. There's nobody that seeks after God. And the Gentiles, of course, it's easy for them. I mean, there's none of them that are good, and they don't seek after God, and they don't pursue him. There, there's none of them that are good. He says, so we're all under this weight of sin in our life. Now, the bad news is this, is, is that we cannot, neither will we pursue a relationship with God our own because we're broken. We're just, we won't do it. We'll, we'll see in a minute with Adam and Eve. They're hiding from God. So we're not going to ever pursue a relationship with God our own. But we have a father who loves us and pursues us that has pursued a relationship with you and I. So whenever anybody hears the gospel, you know that Jesus has come and he's lived and he's died and he's raised from the dead and he's gone to the right hand of God the Father and he's coming back one day to judge the living and the dead. When they hear those, those words, that is, that's part of, it's not all of it, but it's God's pursuit of them to draw them into relationship. So where we could not, neither would we pursue a relationship with the Lord, God is able to do that. He's able to do that and he does. And he does it because he cares for us, and he does it because he loves us now. Now, I want to say, that doesn't mean that we're not responsible, because we are. Because as part of his creation, God has left us with a certain human responsibility to respond to his pursuit of us in relationship with us. It's what John talks about in, in our famous passages in John 3, 16 through about 19. I'm going to read a little bit to you from what he says. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So the responsibility is not on God. The responsibility is on you to, to believe. For you to have faith in Christ, God's done what we could never do in trying to pursue us and right the relationship, but the responsibility of faith is still on, is still on you and I. And that means also that if we are condemned, then that's, that's on me too. Because he goes on to say this, that whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so there is one way for this relationship to be made complete again, and that's through the mediator, the Christ, Jesus, who has died for us. And as we place our faith in him, then the reckon, that relationship with God can be restored and brought back whole. Now you ask a question, like why would anybody say no to that? You know, after I got saved, I thought, man, there's nobody that's going to reject Jesus because this is the greatest thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I began to share with people about what Jesus had done in my life. I was, you know, do you want to ask him into your heart too? And people balk at that. You're like, well, why would you, why would you even hesitate to trust Jesus and to follow him? Because he's good. He's great. And he will bless you in ways you can never imagine. And actually, the reason is given in verse 19 in chapter 3. He says, and this is a judgment that lights come into the world, but, but people, they love the darkness rather than light. We preferred what we were doing rather than what he offered, so they didn't come into the light because their works were evil. So when you think about this in any relationship, I don't know if it's true 100%, but I think it's true most of the time, and uh, you, you can observe this in just other relationships that you've seen around. Whenever there's a problem in a relationship. Usually somebody's been sinned against, they've been wrong, they've been neglected, something was said or done, and, and they, they wait for a response from the offending party, right? You know, they're going to ask for forgiveness, they're going to acknowledge this, they're going to say, hey, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done what I did, I shouldn't have said what I said, and they're, they're kind of waiting, and then sometimes we wait, and we wait, and we're like, well, I don't know what the deal is. Like, why haven't they, why haven't they said anything? We kind of get angry. And then somebody calls, calls a meeting, right? Like, let's sit down, we got to talk. And maybe it's the husband that says to the wife, hey, we got to talk because, you know, some things have happened and my feelings are hurt and you were wrong. Or maybe it's the wife that calls the husband in and says, hey, we need to talk about these things. But usually somebody calls the meeting that was the offended one and the other one sits down at the table. And a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, here's what happens. The guy says, I, I didn't know. Like, I had no idea you felt this way. I had no idea that what I had said had offended you. I had no idea that the way I responded was, was that bad. I, I didn't know. So, so here's my question for you. 
if he didn't know, or she, if he didn't know, then how is he going to fix the relationship? Like, you can't fix what you don't know is wrong. you got to know something's wrong before you're ever able to address it to be able to fix it. And so that's what happened in our relationship with God is, is that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody seeks God. Nobody does what is good. Nobody understands. We don't understand how bad our sin is. We needed God to call a meeting to sit us down at the table and say, let me tell you how what you've done has affected this relationship because we were incapable of fixing what we did not know even existed. Now, what happens at the table between a husband and wife is that when the husband or the wife brings something up like this is what you've done, you've said, you, you were then there's a choice to be made at that moment, isn't there? Like where the guy says, you're right. Or he gets defensive or the wife becomes defensive and she blames the kids or the circumstances or maybe they blame God. I, I just, there's all types of responses that are out there. But what happens is somebody has to respond to that and say either you're right and I agree with you and it's time for change or you're wrong and I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. And people do that same thing with God. When God sits down with us and convicts our heart and our soul of sin in us and he sits us down at the table and he says, here's what's going on, we have a choice to make. We have a choice to make. Whether or not we're going to listen to what he has to say or whether we're going to get defensive, we're going to get angry, we're going to push off from the table, and we're going to walk out the door. And so God, God steps in and he pursues you and I. And he pursues us because he loves us. Now, God, we want to go back to the very beginning and think about Genesis chapter 3 here. What God does in the very beginning is he creates. He's this creative genius. You've got the moon and the stars and the skies and the heavens and the seas and the birds. And, you know, and then you have this, the, the crowning part of creation is Adam and Eve. And God says to them, listen, you eat of all the trees of the garden except for this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to reach out and take that fruit and eat. And yet that's what they did. Okay? Eve did. She took the fruit and she ate it. She gave to her husband. He was there with her. Okay? And so and they, said, they opened Pandora's box of just junk. It's why we've got what we've got. It's why we deal with what we deal. And, and I want to diverge just for a minute, just trying to answer a question for you real quick. Because a lot of times people, people ask me this question, like how, how could a loving God know what he knew was going to happen and allow it to happen? I mean, because if God is omniscient, then he knew that a tree was in the garden because he told them not to eat of the tree. And he knew that if he's omniscient, he knows all things. He knew that Eve and Adam, they were going to make a bad choice. And he still gave them the opportunity to sin against him. So how, how, how does all that work? And, and you know what? It's, it's, a fair, it's a fair question. But I'm going to put it to you between parents and children. Listen, I love my kids. And I know you love your kids. But here, here's the thing. As your children get older, what, what do you do as a loving, caring parent? But what you do is you begin, as, as they grow in maturity, you begin handing over decision-making responsibilities, don't you? you? You begin handing off to them choices. What school do you want to go to? How fast are you going to drive? Who are you going to date? I mean, you know, when they get 25, are you going to be able to tell them, no, you can't, you can't marry him? You know, no, you're not going to tell them that. They're going to look at you and just say, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. You know, I'm going to marry who I want to marry. And, and so at some point for a 25-year-old, it's, no it's no longer even loving or kind if you as mom or dad are still trying to dictate their choices to them. Correct. So out of love and out of care and out of concern for them, you say to them, I've raised you. You know right from wrong. And so now I, I turn you loose to make your, make your own choice. That's what love does. That's what love does. And that's what God has done for us. It wouldn't have been love if he just said, hey, Adam and Eve, sorry. I'm going to make every choice for you for the rest of your life. It's going to be this dictatorial type of choice that I'm going to just exercise over my free creation. God, God didn't do that. At some point, we have to be responsible. And at some point, we understand that our children have to be responsible. It doesn't lessen your love for your children. Actually, actually, it's, it's, 
It's an example. It's evidence that you care enough about them to set them free. Now, as a parent, you know that some of the choices your kids are going to make are going to be great. You'll be like, yeah, good job. That was wonderful. And then you also know that sometimes, as a parent, your children's choices are going to, it's going to be bad. You know? They're, going to, they're liable to crash and burn. But what do you do for those kids? If they crash and burn, do you just let them? Like, hey, you crash and burn, sorry, have fun, enjoy your life? No, because as mom or dad, what you do is you pursue them, don't you? You're like, come here, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to counsel you. I'm going to try and explain to you where you went wrong so that we can kind of try and fix this right now. And so God, in his love and his concern, saw Adam and Eve at a point of their maturity that they should have and could have and were able to say no to this. They failed, and when they failed, God did not walk away and leave them in their sin. God immediately began a pursuit of his children. So God allowed that because that's what love does. That's what love does. It allows people who are free creatures to learn and to grow, and to choose to love God in return. Now, there's three things that happened in the garden that where, where things went wrong. And I'll show you what those are so that you've got a foundation for that. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. It says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired uh, to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, when you sin, is somebody holding up a sign? No. No. When you sin, the first thing that happens to you is you feel it. You feel it. It's the first thing that went wrong here. You will know it in you first. You will feel it in you. If you go back and listen to what what happened. So the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew it. They knew it. Hey, you know what? Adam didn't look at Eve and say, hey, honey, let tell you this. You don't have any clothes on. And Eve didn't look at Adam and say, hey, cover it up, buddy. You know? He, he, she didn't do that for him. God didn't come to them and say, hey, I want to tell you both right now, you're, you're naked. What happened was they knew it in them. So you know it when you sin. You know it when you've said too much. Nobody has to tell you. There's nobody pointing a finger. There's nobody holding the sign up. You know it when you've said too much. You know it when you've gone too far. You know it when you've crossed the line. There's this, there's this thing in us called the conscience that produces an emotion in us called guilt that when you cross the line, you... You know it. Nobody has to tell you. Your wife doesn't have to sit down and and explain it to you. Your husband doesn't have to point it out. Your kids don't have to look at you and go, oh, look, did you see what you just did or said? Nobody has to do that. You know it in you. You know it in you. It's our conscience. And when we have this emotion called guilt, you know, there's two different ways that we deal with, uh, with guilt in our life. And really what we all want is for guilt to go away. I mean, nobody wakes up in the morning and thinks, I hope I feel guilty today. Nobody, nobody does that. Nobody prays like, Lord, please make me feel guilty today. We pray for peace. We pray for joy. We pray for happiness. We're like, I just want to be happy. You know, we, pray, we talk about emotions like that. But nobody wakes up thinking, man, I just I can't wait till I feel guilty today. Because it's a negative emotion, and we all have it. I wonder how that's true. It's because we create the image of God, and, and God gives us this emotion to point things out to us. And so we want to get rid of guilt as soon as possible. And one of the ways that we do it, which is the unhealthy way, is, is that we just keep doing whatever it is that made us feel guilty. Because we know, I mean, we've lived long enough now to know that if we keep doing what we've been doing that made us feel guilty in the first place, we won't feel guilty about it anymore. We'll just be numb to it. The way the Bible explains that is is that our consciences are actually seared as with a hot iron. That means that if you want to look at it, if you want to be that, if you want to say that, if you want to do that, if you want to, you know, whatever, you you just keep doing it. If you do it long enough, it won't bother you anymore. So, I mean, that's a way to do it. If you want to do that, you can't. It's not going to leave you any better off. It's going to leave you hurt. It's going to leave you broken. It's going to leave you still sinning against God, broken in relationship with him. But you won't feel your conscience anymore because you've you've seared it. The other way of dealing with a a guilty conscience is how God explains it to us in the scripture is that you go to God and you say, I felt this. Okay, I acknowledge what it is. And Lord, I've sinned against you and maybe somebody else that's out here. And Father, I I need you to forgive me and I need you to cleanse my heart. And, And we know, at least this is how it works for me. It doesn't 
it doesn't automatically go away. You know, I, it's like I'm, I ask for forgiveness and I pray for cleansing, and then it just kind of, you know, as the day goes on or a couple of days goes on, you just you feel like your relationship with God is kind of restored and kind of put back where it needs to be. But when we sin, we feel it in us first. Second, second is this, is you'll see it in your relationship with other people. So it's not just that you feel it in you, but you feel it in, you, you just get this sense in your relationship with others. It says, in the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So listen, there, there was none of this between Adam and Eve up to this point. I mean, it was, a, it was what you expect marriage to be. It's what you expect a friendship to be. It's what you expect soulmates to be. That, that's how things were. But it was when sin entered into both of their lives that all of a sudden there's this disconnect between the two of them. They became suspicious of one another. It's like, hey, you, you can't see this and you, you can't see that. And they, they're hiding things from one another. And so all of a sudden this relationship that was everything God had intended it to be, now, now it's not that anymore. And so they felt it in their relationship. And the third thing is this, is that you're going to see it in your reaction to God. It's like you feel it in you first, you know. Then it kind of seeps out into the relationships around you and it it affects them in a negative way, and then all of a sudden you see it in your reaction to God because what it says in verse 8 is that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And isn't that what happens to us? They were like, I'm not going to go back to church. You know, usually whenever anybody walks away from God, this is the first thing that happens. It's like, I'm, I'm not going back to church. And, and I don't, I'm not going to pick up my scripture. I'm not going to read that. <laughs> no. And I'm not going to pray. And if somebody begins to talk to you about Jesus, you're like, hey, man, I you know, appreciate it. Thanks. Love you too. But I don't want to talk about that. I don't talk about him anymore. And so we, we get this reaction to God. Our reaction to God is to hide from him, right? I mean, it's not necessarily the trees of the garden, but it's home. It's the boat. It's the hunting lease. It's the bed. It's the television. It's whatever you're doing on Friday nights, whatever, it's whatever we're doing, just, just keep him out of our mind because we don't, we don't want to open up the word of God because that's talking about God. We don't want to be around our Christian friends because they remind us of where we should be, but we're not right now. We, we don't want to be in prayer because, you know, that's talking to him and I really don't want to hear from him right now. I don't want to go to church because that whole, that whole thing represents God and everything that he wants for me in my life. So I'm going to leave all that behind. And, and, and you might be here just not by accident, but not really intending to be here and like, wow, that's what I've been doing. That's what's been happening in my life. I mean, I, I've sinned. I've knew it in me. I've, it's affected relationships, and now I've been hiding from God. And just through God's sovereignty, I just showed up here this morning. And God's speaking to you and said, this, this is what's going on. So that you understand that God, God's pursuing you right now. He's pursuing your heart. And it's going to leave you with a choice whether or not you're going to respond to him or you're going to drift away from him again. So God asks a question. So they're, they're hiding, right? They're hiding. And this is the first question ever in Scripture. God comes to them and asks them a question. He says, where, where are you? Now, it's not that God doesn't know where they are. God knows where they are. He needs them to know where they are. He's like, where are you? I need you to understand because they, they were lost and didn't know it. They needed him. They didn't understand that because, again, you go back to this whole idea of sin in somebody's life. They were unaware of it. They were not doing good. They weren't seeking God. There was Nothing was good was happening in their life. And they needed to be aware that God was pursuing them. And so God asked him, he's like, where are you? Where are you? And when he asks that question, what he does in his pursuit is he begins to extend grace to them. And I want you to know this, grace always confronts sin. Don't, don't be offended when God confronts your sin. Don't Try not to be offended when other people confront your sin. Be because really it, it's an aspect of God's grace because that's what's got to change if you want to be, be made whole again. Here's his confrontation of their sin in verses 11 through 13. It says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman you, that you gave with me, she, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And, and if you've ever studied this passage before, you know, you know a lot of this. You're like, the guy's blaming the wife, and the wife's blaming the serpent. And 
she's blaming God, you know, if you hadn't done this and I wouldn't have done that. And, and we do, I mean, it's just a repetitive thing over and over and over again. Every single generation, we want to blame our mom and we want to blame our dad and we want to blame our boyfriend and we want to blame our wife and blame our kids and we want to blame God and we'll say, God, you know, if you hadn't allowed this to happen, then, then I would be in a better place. Just all that just goes away. Listen, God's going to confront that because really the issue is in your heart. It's what's going on inside of you. And I want you to know why God pursues you. He pursues you because he loves you. And what we find here in Genesis chapter 3 is the very first mention that Jesus is, is on his way. In verse 14 it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And so that's God's curse against Satan. And then he says to the devil, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, this is Jesus, and between your offspring and her offspring. It means that Jesus was going to be born out of the line of the woman. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You're going to strike him, but he's going to crush. He's going to crush you. And so God promises at that time that even though Adam and Eve opened Pandora's box, man, we're, we're going to have a mess from here, that I'm going to provide a way out. That, that I'm going to pursue my children who have stepped away from me. And in his pursuit of you, he's going to ask you this question. He says, where are you? You know, what, what's going on in, in your life right now? It's kind of how are things with you right now? You know, are you blaming God? Maybe you're running from God. Maybe you've excused a lot of things in your life that really you know they've been an excuse, but you really need, you, you need to change. I don't want to talk about your husband. I don't want to talk about your wife. I don't want to talk about your kids. I want, let's just talk about you and your heart. Because here, here's the emotion I want you to pay attention to right, right now and, and really for the next week is that emotion of guilt. Because I, th I think as people, when we feel guilt, like a conviction of the Spirit of God, we, when we feel guilt, we... I think we automatically think it's some sort of a punishment from God. Like God doesn't like me, he's making me feel bad about me. God doesn't care about me, so, so he's made me deal with this emotion that I, I try to avoid and run from. But, but just think about this a little this way. That possibly, possibly, that guilt that you feel when you've gone too far, said too much, done something you shouldn't have done, is really God's, God's gift to you. God's first step for you to, to enter into freedom. Freedom from the things that have bound you. Freedom from the things that have kept you from great relationships with other people and, and with your God. And so as we close in just a minute, I just want you to think about just those areas of your life. Maybe God's just kind of brought up that feeling of guilt, that emotion of guilt, what it's about. And then let's deal with that. Deal with that in a biblical manner. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes for this time of prayer.